It is truly amazing how quickly a person can vanish. This especially applies to children. Look away for only a moment and they can be gone. Typically when this happens, they are found shortly after, much to the relief of the parents. But it's a family's worst nightmare to lose sight of your child and then be unable to find them. In this video, we are going to look at a number of children who disappeared very suddenly after their parents either left them alone or lost sight of them, even if only for a moment. In September of 1937, four-year-old Florence Jackson and her parents traveled from their home to Oak Grove, Arkansas to visit relatives. On September 6th, the family, including Florence's grandparents, traveled outside the city to visit a sawmill owned by Mrs. Jackson's brother. They drove as far as they could, then parked on the roadside and set out on foot. A short distance into the woods, Florence began complaining that some new shoes she was wearing were hurting her feet. Florence's parents gave her permission to run back to the car where her grandmother was waiting. She never found her way back to the vehicle, however. When the rest of the family made it back and found out Florence was gone, they informed authorities. More than 700 people ended up joining the search. The first clue they found was Florence's shoes and stockings laying on a high ridge, yards apart, as though she was removing her clothes while on the move. The next day, a piece of her dress was found snagged on a thorn bush. The very rugged countryside, as well as hard rain, hampered the efforts of many searchers. On September 10th, Mrs. Godwin, a farmer's wife who lived four miles from the area where Florence disappeared, heard someone calling out to her. She walked around her property and eventually down to a nearby creek where she discovered the source of the sounds. She saw Florence on the opposite bank of the creek. All her clothes were torn away, and she was carrying a tomato and a handful of edible weeds. Mrs. Godwin waded across the creek in order to grab Florence and bring her back to the farmhouse. The little girl's body was covered in scratches, and she had burrs in her hair, but no major injuries. She said that she had survived by eating wild grapes, tomatoes, and weeds. The Godwins were able to get in touch with authorities, who then took the Jackson parents out to the farm to retrieve their daughter. Even though the farm was only a few air miles from the area where Florence disappeared, the family had to travel 25 miles of winding road to reach the farm due to the ruggedness of the countryside. Florence was then taken to the hospital where she was questioned by police. During this interview, Florence revealed the strange details of her ordeal. She said she had spent one night in a log, another in a tree, another on a flat rock, and the fourth with a black man and woman in a house deep in the hills. Initially, this last part of her story was not believed because locals and authorities knew that nobody lived in the hills where Florence had been lost, and even if they did, the massive search party would almost have certainly stumbled upon it at some point. Florence, however, elaborated on her story, saying that a black man and woman picked me up, they put me on a cot, and then gave me breakfast, and then told me to go on. I was mad and hit them with my hands. A number of people, including the attending nurse, believed Florence's story, despite the lack of physical evidence. Her mother would be quoted saying that it was more than the hand of man that saved her child. Florence's tale of survival is quite incredible. Why would she remove all her clothes, and how did she survive naked during the days of hard rain that followed? How did Florence, at four years old, know which edible plants to eat while she was lost? How was she able to cover four miles of some of the most rugged terrain without shoes or clothes? When considering all these questions, the mother's sentiment that it was more than the hand of man that saved her daughter becomes understandable. 
and, of course, what to make of her story about the cabin in the woods, of the couple that took her in for the night, fed her, and then sent her on her way. Did Florence invent this story, or did it really happen? In August of 1955, the Hat Key family drove from their home to Cottonwood Butte in order to pick huckleberries. The Butte is a large hill almost 25 miles east of the Washington state border, and it rises about 800 feet above the surrounding terrain. Located at the top is a large radar installation, which in 1955 had not been constructed yet. When the Hatkey family arrived at the base of Cottonwood Butte, two-year-old Richard Hatkey was asleep, so his parents left him in the car while they walked a short distance to begin picking. When the family returned to their vehicle after they were finished, they found their truck empty. Richard was nowhere to be found. The family informed authorities and collected volunteers to assist in searching for their missing child. So many people participated that nearby towns were devoid of men. The searchers combed the area in lines, each individual just six feet apart so that they wouldn't miss the small two-year-old. Early the next morning, a neighbor who was assisting in the search was walking uphill in a rocky area full of fallen timber while calling out the young boy's name when he heard crying. He then discovered Richard pinned in the branches of a fallen tree so tightly that he couldn't move. The man rescued the young child and took him back to his parents, where he was found to be in good condition. When the parents tried to communicate with their son, they said that he doesn't talk too well, and when we ask him what happened, he just laughs. There are some persisting questions in the disappearance of Richard Hatkey, how was he able to open the car door and escape without anyone noticing? And how was he able to climb up a rocky hill over large timber logs at his age? It's unfortunate that Richard was unable to effectively communicate what happened to him, but apparently he found it to be quite funny. In June of 1965, the Borden-Kircher family, consisting of the parents and their five children, traveled from their house in Yuba City to a cabin they had near the shore of Lake Tahoe. Two-year-old Jamie was one of the four boys and single girl that made up the Borden-Kircher children. The family arrived at their cabin, exited their vehicle, and immediately began to unload their supplies. During this time, Jamie ran to a wood-seated swing located in the front yard. According to Jamie's brother, Mike, he noticed his little brother on the swing, ducked inside the cabin for a moment, came back outside, and saw that the swing was now empty, still swaying gently in the wind. Jamie had suddenly vanished. The family immediately began searching for him thinking a two-year-old could not have gotten far in the short time that they were not paying attention. After an hour of running around and calling his name, the family informed authorities that he was missing. California's Placer County Sheriff and Nevada's Washoe County Sheriff both participated in what would be one of the largest searches ever in the Lake Tahoe area. Authorities searched the vicinity of the cabin using teams of bloodhounds. The Coast Guard patrolled the banks of the lake, and divers searched the water in case Jamie had made it that far and fallen in. No evidence was discovered. Authorities were baffled how he could have vanished so completely, with no hazards like open mines, wells, or snakes in the area. Searchers soon realized that it would not have made sense for Jamie to have headed downhill towards the lake, or someone would have seen him. The other option was that he went uphill into a densely forested area. Hundreds of searchers began combing the wilderness uphill from the cabin, but still not even a single footprint was found. An FBI agent was on scene for much of the search, monitoring events as they unfolded. 
This lack of evidence left the family with a lot of questions. Did Jamie run off into the woods? Was he somehow able to run over a thousand yards down to the lake and drown? Did an animal get a hold of him and take him away? There was no real evidence pointing in any direction. Over 40 years later, with still no discovery of a body, it was reported that the Bordenkircher family was trying to bring attention back to the case with a new theory that Jamie was kidnapped. They believe he might have made it to a nearby highway where he was taken. A sheriff's lieutenant who led the search for Jamie seemed to agree. He was quoted saying, This was the only case in my whole career that I couldn't let go of. I think the boy was walking and a motorist and his wife took him. Images of an age-progressed Jamie Bordenkircher can be found online, showing what he might look like today. At this point, it's unlikely the fate of Jamie will ever be discovered, but his sudden vanishing has left behind a broken family with many questions. The odds of a passing motorist seeing young Jamie and taking him may seem slim, but the lack of evidence in this case leaves few other conventional alternatives. In April of 1964, the Edwards family was camping and hiking over the weekend in the Mojave Desert, 18 miles west of Rosamund, California. The parents had brought along two-year-old Kenneth and his two older siblings. On Sunday, the family was out on a hike with the parents leading and the children trailing behind. Kenneth was last in line as the rest of the family came over the top of a hill in the afternoon. The two older children called for him to hurry, but Kenneth never crested the top of the hill. The family doubled back to look for him, but the child had simply vanished. The family then performed a preliminary search before eventually contacting the Kern County Sheriff's in the late afternoon. The area where he was lost is full of deep gullies and hills, with many abandoned mines. There was also concern over how cold the desert could get at this time of year. Over 600 searchers turned out to look for Kenneth, including bloodhounds, airplanes, and vehicles. On Monday, they discovered Kenneth's jacket and sweatshirt, about two miles east of the family campsite. On Tuesday, a couple of friends of the family stumbled across Kenneth's body on a cliffside. This was a place the professional searchers had largely ignored because they thought it would be too difficult for a child to get to. This area was over a mile to the west of the campsite. The only explanation that was offered for this was that the child must have wandered in circles for miles, while somehow bypassing the many searchers on the ground. A coroner would determine that the child died from cold winds and temperatures early Monday, some 14 hours after he disappeared. While questions lingered as to how Kenneth vanished in the first place, some reports indicated he might have been chasing a rabbit he spotted. It is unknown why he removed his warm clothing or how he was able to cross through the bustling search lines only to perish on a cliffside. Two weeks after this incident, these same searchers would be involved in the search for Frankie Hubert, who disappeared in much the same way in the nearby Angeles National Forest. Frankie had also been on a hike with his family. His father would say, Frankie had been behind me. When I turned around, he was gone, vanished completely. Fortunately for this family, Frankie would be found after 10 hours of searching. These cases demonstrate just how important it is to keep a close eye on children, especially when in or near the woods or any unfamiliar territory. None of these families expected anything could happen until it did, and it only took a split second. In most of these cases, we don't know if the child ran off on their own or if they were influenced by something. It can be surprising to think about how looking away for only a moment 
can be such a life-changing decision. Hopefully, these stories can act as a warning and raise awareness for parents in the future. Until next time, thanks for watching.